There is an urgent problem with food waste in today's society. With the average Australian household throwing out $1,036 worth of food every year, this amounts to Australia wasting $8 billion worth of edible food every year. To put that in perspective, if you add up all the food in Australia that we waste each year, it's enough to fill 450,000 garbage trucks. Placed end to end, this convoy would bridge the gap between Australia and New Zealand over three times. But how do we combat such a large issue? That's a good question. It is obvious that food preservation is the most effective method to deal with this problem. But first, we need to understand the process of food spoilage. Do you know that there are different types of food spoilage? There are physical, chemical and microbial spoilages. Physical spoilage involves the hardening of a soft food product, the softening of a crunchy food product, or the damaging of food, such as during transportation. Chemical spoilage is rotting that is not caused by the action of microbial enzymes, but rather the natural decay of the food, such as oxidation of fatty acids. This has a deleterious effect on the flavour, colour and nutritional value of the food. Microbial spoilage is primarily due to the growth and metabolism of yeasts, moulds and bacteria. These develop sour flavours, off aromas, structural deterioration, along with other harmful toxins and pathogens. But how do we prevent these spoilages? Now that's a good question. There are many factors that influence the rate of the spoilage, such as water activity, temperature, nutrient availability, pH and oxygen. By controlling these factors, physical, chemical and microbial spoilage of food can be slowed and controlled to a greater extent. Food spoilage has been an issue for humans for a very long time. Ancient Romans and Egyptians used basic methods of preserving foods, such as salting, sugaring, smoking and drying in order to keep them from rotting. With the development of science and technology, we have discovered more effective techniques of preserving food we eat, in particular the development of chemical preservatives. But let's talk about chemical and microbial spoilage. Antimicrobial preservatives are those such as nitrates, sulfates, sorbates and benzoates, which each respond differently to different microorganisms. A preservative which we have been focusing on is potassium sorbate, and its mechanism is quite complex involving antimicrobial activities at different sites of the microorganism. Potassium sorbate works by inhibiting the Krebs cycle and electron chain functions in the microorganism required for metabolism. This is done by slowing down the formation of essential substrates such as glucose and pyruvate required for the organism to survive. Sorbate doesn't just starve the microorganism, but it also acts on the organism's survival and reproduction cycle. By acting on the spore membranes and altering their permeability, it makes them much more susceptible to their surrounding environment. In addition, sorbate inhibits protease enzymes which are essential for the spore's germination. These mechanisms in turn seize the growth of moulds, yeast and bacteria. Although this is just one antimicrobial preservative, there are a variety of preservatives that inhibit the growth of microorganisms in a variety of different ways. Often these are used in conjunction with one another to eliminate or minimize risk of microbial spoilage. An experiment we conducted shows strawberries going through natural decay. The bottom row has been treated with potassium sulfate, while the row above has not. As you can see, the old strawberry that has not been treated with the preservative becomes ridden with fungus very quickly, while the other remains unaffected for much longer. The growth of the fungus on the rightmost agar is greatly affected by the presence of the sulfate, and you can know the different species of microorganisms. The sulfate evidently was not effective to prevent the growth of this microbe. However, in the fresh strawberry treated with the preservative solution, there was a higher moisture content than the one without, and therefore a moist environment in the egg plate promoted growth of the microbe. Oxidation refers to the redox reaction that occur in food. When the food is exposed to oxygen, many compounds lose electrons and bound to oxygen as it is highly electronegative. Oxidation of food is a destructive process, causing undesirable color, flavor change, and loss in nutritional value. Let's take apple browning for example. When an apple is cut, phenolase, a natural occurring enzyme in the cell, acts as a catalyst for the oxidation of the amino acid tyrosine. 
The final product of the enzymatic reaction is melanin, which has a dark brown color and results in what we see as the apple browning. So how can we prevent this from happening? Now that's a good question. As we have discussed, there are three active components in the browning process, tyrosine, phenolase, and oxygen. Therefore, we can interrupt this process by eliminating any one of the crucial components. Since tyrosine is impossible to get rid of every time you cut open an apple, our choices are to inactivate the enzyme or remove the oxygen entirely. Enzyme activity can be ceased by denaturing the enzyme through blanching, irradiating, pasteurizing or acidifying. Activity can also be slowed by the refrigeration or freezing of the sample. The oxygen can be removed by airtight or vacuum packing or modifying the atmosphere to an inert gas such as nitrogen. Another type of preservative called antioxidants focuses on slowing down the natural oxidation of fats and oils in foods. The double bonds in unsaturated fatty acids that are found in fats and oils eventually become oxidated releasing volatile aldehydes and ketones into the food. These functional groups are the cause of the undesirable characteristics of rancidity, such as foul odour and flavour. Antioxidants can inhibit oxidation by using up both the free radicals and oxygen molecules before they react with the double bonds in the fatty acid molecules. In turn, this delays the process of natural oxidation. But if these chemicals are able to kill bacteria, won't they affect us too? The wide use of preservatives has indeed raised some health issues. The main problem is the impact of chemical preservatives on human health. Research has showed that there are many negative effects of the use of preservatives. Nitrates and nitrites, which you'll find in bacon, ham and sausages, may increase risk of diabetes, diarrhoea and respiratory tract infections in children. According to the World Health Organization, Animal studies reveal that high doses of sodium benzoate may cause damage to the heart, spleen, liver, kidneys, brain and adrenal glands. When combined with vitamin C, sodium benzoate may pose a small risk of cancers, including leukemia. However, dietary studies indicate that for the majority of the population, the dietary exposure to these preservatives is well below what they need to be to cause any noticeable damage. So there is no public health risk for the consumption of a balanced diet, which includes some of these common preservatives. Though the regulations placed on these preservatives should be continuously improved and perfected, as these are still dangerous chemicals which we are putting on our foods and eating. Despite all this though, the importance of preservatives in today's society cannot be understated. Preservatives establish a sense of trust between the consumer and the producer maintaining flavour, colour, texture, aroma, and allowing mass production of food and worldwide distribution.